Dr. Brian Lynn, come on up. I am an ER doctor, and oh yes, there will be blood. Who here has had a trip to the ER in San Francisco? Yeah. Who here has had a trip to my ER in the San Francisco? I oftentimes feel like when I'm up here, I'm representing not just myself, but all of emergency medicine, so I hope I do a good job, and, um, and I hope you like the talk. So my talk is called My Doctor Glued Me Back Together and Other Cautionary Tales from the ER. You know, when I tell people I'm an ER doctor, there's usually a couple really like stereotyped reactions that I get from people, and it depends largely on the situation in which I'm in. So for example, if I'm at the PTA meeting for like my kid's school where people are kind of on their best behavior and acting nice and the talk is kind of just scratching the surface, people will tend to re react when I reveal that I'm an ER doctor by saying, that must be really stressful. <laughs> and it is stressful, but it's also a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun where I work. Some of the fun is just in the idiosyncrasies of the place. We've got this emergency sign and then the do not enter sign that's like right in front of it. <laughs> and how many of you guys are having a good time here at Nerd Night tonight? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's assume or pretend that you are having like the best nerd night. Like, the best nerd night ever. And you continue on at the party and maybe have just a couple too many drinks and find yourself passed out on the street somewhere in San Francisco. <laughs> and then let's say some good Samaritan calls an ambulance and you find yourself in the ER. I want to make a couple promises to you. Number one. We will make sure that you guys, if you are having a, an emergency related to your airway or your breathing or circulation, we will take care of that. We'll also make sure that you guys have a safe place to rest until your people can come and find you. Because in the ER, I've got the luxury of being able to see patients regardless of ability to pay, race, religion, ethnicity, age, gender, documents. And I think that's pretty awesome. And after the work is done, we do have a little bit of fun in the ER as well. This is like a typical night shift for us in the ER. And my favorite part, my favorite part of this video is that this doctor right here is like a resident who walked in, had no idea this was happening, and just jumps right in. And that's because, that's because the energy in the ER is truly infectious. <laughs> now, the second stereotypical reaction is the one that happens at the family reunion. And this is where like a drunken uncle will come up to me and just sort of feel free to say when it's on his mind. And it's usually something like, you should get out of the ER and specialize and become a cardiologist and make some real money. Well, uncle, for the 18th, umpteenth time, let me explain how medical education works. And I think this may be an education for many in the room. So it's true that we all begin in medical school as undifferentiated stem cells. <laughs> However, after a couple of years, we have to commit ourselves to one of these specialties. And these are like the time-honored specialties that have been around for a century or so. But as it turns out, taking care of a patient in the first few hours of their illness in itself is kind of a specialty, and that was recognized in 1979 when the specialty of emergency medicine was established. So if I were to want to become a cardiologist, I would have had to complete a training in internal medicine, followed by a fellowship in cardiology, and if I really want to be that rich cardiologist, I have to do a couple more years of interventional training. It doesn't even fit on the slide. <laughs> And so, as you see, Uncle, there's no pathway for me from emergency medicine to interventional cardiology. But I'm really happy with my decision. You know, there's a lot of things. I, I was thinking a lot about what brought me to my specialty. There's obviously a lot of different moments that are formative for you as you're choosing your specialty. Um, I'm going to share just one with you. This is me in New York City on September 10th, 2001, my white coat ceremony, when I got my first short white coat and I recited the Hippocratic Oath for the first time and was feeling pretty good about myself. And then the next morning was September 11th of 2001, and this is a photograph that I took from my dorm room looking downtown of the plumes of smoke where the World Trade Center towers used to be. And I remember thinking at that moment that I never wanted to feel that helpless again in my life. And so that is why I chose a specialty where I would be able to help anyone, anything, or at any time. And that's our motto in emergency medicine. So 
So one more typical situation at the cocktail party. This is where people, you know, on the first pass, kind of come around and maybe a drink or two and say, you must see some pretty crazy things. And then they'll go back to the bar and have a couple more drinks. And then they'll come back and say the thing that they really wanted to say, which is, you must see some crazy things that people shove up their butts. Yeah. <laughs> and so I bring to you guys a file from ER Confidential, compiled from my friends, ER doctors around the country, just a couple for you. So I, I gave them captions. I call this one really buzzed. That's the inner workings of a vibrator. I mean, this one's actually pretty tame, right? Because at least a vibrator kind of has business in that region. <laughs> this one I call, I get a little crazy when I get a little beer in me. And then, not everybody recognized what they're looking at initially, so let me make it a little easier to understand. This one is, um, I prefer shots. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, let me give you guys one of my real stories from the ER that's gonna be a transition into what I'm really gonna to talk to you about tonight. We're gonna to call this Just Another Saturday Night in the ER. So Saturday night is a witching hour in the ER, especially when it's a full moon out. So it's, there's our entrance. Once again, a lot of do not enter signs, which I find kind of funny. But on this particular night at about 2 a.m., who comes in but this gal and this guy? <laughs> And so, you know, they were engaging in some late night BDSM revelry, having some fun. And we were all kind of looking at them, all right, what's this going to be about? And the guy's got this laceration across his chin. And so I asked him, what happened? And he says, well, I, I fell out of a chair and I hit my chin. I said, okay, well, and why didn't you just put your hands out to protect yourself from falling? And he said, well, I couldn't because she had me handcuffed to the back of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, I got the story, good enough, let's get to work. So this is what I'm gonna do for you. Like I said, anyone, anytime, anything, no judgment here. Sir, I am going to anesthetize your wound with lidocaine so you will feel no pain. Then I'm gonna clean out that wound with saline and then we're gonna sew it up and make it so you have a minimal scar. And the guy thinks for a second, he looks at me and he says, that all sounds great, doctor except for the part about the anesthesia. <laughs> so, now I'm thinking like, should I, shouldn't I? And as a doctor, it actually is kind of easier to sew something together when you haven't distended the margins with the anesthetic, so there's that. On the other hand, if I'm gonna do this, I should probably have a safe word going in. <laughs> and so we did it, and I can't show you his face because of you know HIPAA and all that, but this like smiley face emoji is kind of like how he was looking at me when we were all done. <laughs> We haven't been in touch since, but I hope he's doing well. So there's my segue into the, the real talk. You know, I'm not a specialist per se, but I do have a special area of interest within emergency medicine, and that is emergency wound care. From that interest, I created this online blog called Closing the Gap, which is for healthcare practitioners to learn about acute techniques in emergency wound care. Now, in the past, suturing was the only way we did it, but there have been a lot of different technologies that have emerged over the last couple of decades. So you guys have been to the ER know that we use tape, we use staples, and sometimes we even use glue. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about the uses of glue in emergency wound care. So here's a kid, look how nervous he looks. He doesn't really know what's coming up, but after the glue is applied, he's like, yeah, I really got away with something tonight. <laughs> so a brief history of cyanoacrylate skin glues, which is what I'm talking about. You know, they weren't actually developed for medical purposes. Originally, they were developed for violence. Cyanoacrylate glues were an accidental discovery around the time of World War II, and they were meant to be an adhesive to put gun sights onto the barrels of guns. But as it turns out, it didn't really work that well for that purpose, so it kind of got passed on to something else, and it became a hardware store product. So these are the chemical formulas of methyl cyanoacrylate, and ethyl cyanoacrylate, crazy glue, you're probably familiar with. And these are things you find in the hardware store, crazy glue, this is a, one of the silly commercials from the 1970s where they tout that with just a single drop of glue, this guy can be suspended in midair. And they show you all the other different hobby work and models and things you can do with crazy glue. And so that became its primary use around that time. But then future iterations of tissue of uh, cyanoacrylate glues were developed for specifically for medical use. 
Um, before you know it, we had octal-2 cyanoacrylate, dermabond, or liquiband, and histocryl and indermil, or butyl-2 cyanoacrylate. The main difference with these in chemical structure being that the alkyl chains are much longer in these formulations than in the other iterations I showed you, and that's going to be relevant in a minute, so hold that thought. Before I talk to you about that, I'm going to talk to you about skin glue in the ER and how we use it. Now, we definitely use it for those basic, simple lacerations, but we use it in some other more creative ways as well. ER docs are really creative. In 2002, somebody came up with this idea. So we see a lot of little kids with scalp lacerations, and it used to be the way we just staple across those wounds. That's obviously terrifying for a little kid. So somebody came up with this idea, the hair apposition technique, where you simply take the child's strands of their own hair, twist them up, treat them as if they're like embedded sutures in the scalp, twist them around the wound, and then simply apply a drop of glue right there where the strands meet. And then you can walk down the entire wound and close the entire wound like that. I didn't expect this part to be funny. <laughs> but you, basically the beauty of this is that this kid doesn't have to worry about scary staples or sutures. And when the glue dissolves, the hair simply unravels, the laceration is closed, and the patient is well cared for and feels happy. So we like to use glue for a lot of things, but we do get a little nervous when we're using it around the eye, right? Because if that glue leaks onto the eyelid, suddenly you've glued somebody's eye shut, and that is not bueno. <laughs> so we try to avoid that, and um, somebody came up with a good trick for this as well. We take the adhesive tape that we would use for an IV start, and we kind of just creatively cut a little window out of it. And then by doing that, you're able to place that adhesive over the person's eye and glue in that little window so there's no risk of gluing their eyelid shut, which is pretty cool. So somebody came up with that, and that's a pretty commonly used trick when gluing around the eye in the ER. Another way that I've seen glue used that's interesting is for tongue lacerations. So Tissue adhesive glue technically is for use on epidermal wounds, basically on the skin surface. But somebody in 2013 published this case report or this idea they had to close a tongue laceration with skin glue. And, you know, they did their homework. They made sure that it would be safe if swallowed, theoretically, before using it. They went ahead and closed the laceration. It healed pretty miraculously using that method. Now, I don't use glue on the tongue very often, but that gave me an idea that I used to solve the most annoying injury in the world. But before we talk about what that is, let's go back to ER Confidential just for a moment yeah. to break it up. I labeled these pair, I only put organic products in my body. Those organic products being a cucumber. And can anyone tell what the second thing is? Onion. That is an onion. Very good. Correct. Okay, let's get back to the top. So, the most annoying injury in the world, to me, wait for it, here's your chance to opt out, was this. You know what I'm talking about, these little ditzel wounds off a finger. It doesn't happen to this guy, actually. This guy's got really nice knife handling skills. He's got his fingers curved back against the blade. He's chopping a perfect parmentier. I'm not worried about this guy. I'm worried about this guy, who's basically got a crowded cutting board, whose fingers are right up against the blade. Let's be honest, there's usually a little something involved as well. And I swear to you, I see an injury like this between like three and midnight around dinner time. Almost every night I'm working in the fast track in the ER. You guys ready for it? Yeah! Do it! Bring it. The problem with these wounds is they bleed like stick. They do not stop bleeding, and that's what drives people to come and visit me in the ER for help. And the tricky thing about these wounds is that when something is actively bleeding, it's hard to glue it. I remember asking one of my attending physicians when I was in residency, why don't I just glue this thing? To which they said, ah, young Padawan. <laughs> If you try to glue that bloody wound, it's going to be a big bloody mess. It's going to look kind of like this. This is, this is actually just Trace Leche's cake on my son's mouth around his first birthday. But it does kind of look like this, just to give you a picture. And so I started thinking about it, and I said, well, what if this wound wasn't bleeding? And I came up with a technique that I ended up publishing in the Journal of Emergency Medicine that was kind of just a simple idea, but it worked. So again, here you have this wound. It just bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. No matter how much pressure, no matter what you try and do, it will not stop bleeding. And that's why somebody comes to see me in the ER for help. So my idea was 
pretty simple. Let's make this thing stop bleeding so that we can glue it. So the very first thing was to put a tourniquet around the finger in order to stop the arterial inflow of blood so you're not getting any more blood to the finger. And after that tourniquet is on nice and snug, the second step is to elevate the limb above the level of the patient's heart so you're delivering less blood to the finger. Now there's still the venous blood that's sitting inside of the finger, so we actually have to kind of milk all that blood out of the digit first. Kind of gross, I know. And once you've done that, you observe the wound for complete hemostasis. So you make sure it's not bleeding anymore. And once you've done that, now is the key moment where you can apply that same tissue adhesive glue that we've been talking about earlier to something that's no longer bleeding. So when you do this, you create like a hemostatic cap over the wound. You give it a couple minutes to dry. You might have to dab away some of the extra glue or perhaps put a couple additional layers of glue onto the wound in order to make sure you've got that sealant over the wound. But when you're done, you get this nice clean hemostatic bandage on the wound as you remove the tourniquet. So after I put this out there, it kind of spread like wildfire. It got on like Twitter and all these social media networks and we you know, other doctors, it turns out we're doing kind of similar, but not exactly the same things. And I revised the technique and now it's out there in the world, which is pretty cool. There was one problem though, which is that this plus Dermabond worked, but I forgot about Ethicon who makes Dermabond and they're like, uh-uh, this is an off-label use of our product. So you got to prove to us that you're not doing something dangerous for people. So the first thing I set out to do was something that doesn't come very naturally for ER doctors, which is I had to follow up on my patients for the long term. <laughs> And so I snapped pictures of these injuries and I followed up with these patients like six to nine months down the line and they healed pretty amazing. Left side being the injury, right side being the healing. A lot of these times you could barely even tell there was an injury in the first place. So that was my first good evidence that this worked. Now, with all of this said, guys, please don't try this at home. I gotta say the number one clinical question that I get from friends and family members in like calls or text messages is when they get a little injury to their hand or somewhere, they'll send me a photograph and say, could I use regular instant glue to close this? So it's a good question, right? Could I just take crazy glue out of my hardware kit and close this wound as opposed to going to the ER and paying 300, $600, whatever for this medical grade glue? What's the difference here? Well, I'm gonna tell you. So, Crazy Glue is ethyl cyanoacrylate. We've seen this already. Its major degradation product by hydrolytic excision is this. Anybody? Thank you. This is formaldehyde. And while I don't have any specific evidence that formaldehyde is necessarily bad for you, I still can't believe that starting the process of embalming yourself <laughs> through your open wound is good for you. So the difference here is that when you're talking about the medical grade cyanoacrylate glues, those longer alkyl chains come into play because the degradation to formaldehyde takes a lot longer. And this glue actually sloughs off in about four to five days time. So there's not been significant time to develop that formaldehyde and the patient's less likely in theory to develop toxicities. There's another big reason why you shouldn't be using crazy glue on your skin at home and that is a lesson learned from a case report that was published a couple years back of a two-year-old kid who basically got into his parents' hardware box, took out some crazy glue, and just started gluing all over his pajamas and going to town. Now, something actually pretty awful happened, which is the glue came off and it took off a bunch of his skin. Oh, I forgot the bunny for this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what happened here? How the heck did glue cause this to happen? Well, this is how cyanoacrylate glues actually form their bonds. Basically, a, as soon as, you know, they're packed in a um, vacuum sealed container with no water, but as soon as they see moisture, and it just takes a tiny bit of moisture like you'd find on a person's skin, or even if you open it up to air, the moisture in the air, that water will react with the cyanoacetate molecule, create an anion, and that will bridge to the next cyanoacetate molecule, and on, on, and on it goes and so forth until you've got this polymer bridge of cyanoacetate molecules, which is basically the crux of how this technique works. Now, I've animated these in with fire, and that's because this is an exothermic reaction. So if you think about it, adding cotton pajamas to something like this is basically like adding kindling to a fire. And that's how this kid ended up walking away with this big burn. Now, obviously, this is a pretty rare complication, but it's still, in my mind, one reason why you should be a little cautious when you're playing around with hardware store glue at home when you're talking about fixing wounds. So, 
that is the crux of the serious stuff I wanted to say. Um, I did want to give you one more ER situation. Um, I call this getting real with friends, and I consider all of you guys here at Nerd Night to be my friends. Now that we've shared the stories, and we've shared a bear, beer, and we've shared a shot, and we've shared a cucumber, and we've shared an onion. <laughs> And sometimes people give me this comment, which is, it must be really cool to save a life. And it definitely is really cool to save a life. But you know, the reality is, in my profession, I spend much more of my time counseling people or reassuring people who are worried well, or just kind of guiding somebody through a disease process that would probably get better on its own. But every now and then, a real bona fide emergency comes through. So I'm going to take you to July 7th of 2016, when a gentleman showed up at our ER registration window, complaining of crushing substernal chest pain. He didn't make it past registration before he collapsed on the ground in front of the registration person. But our staff was really quick thinking, grabbed him, put him on a stretcher, immediately started CPR, and brought him to our code room, where I got to meet him for the first time. So. I noticed he was in ventricular fibrillation, which is a deadly rhythm that basically is not compatible with life because you don't get any blood flow to the brain. And I initiated the usual measures. We shock people, we use adrenaline, and you know what? You'd be amazed. It's actually pretty easy to keep a body going with the use of drugs and electric shocks. The thing that is harder, much harder to do, is to make sure that when you bring that body back, the brain is still in the driver's seat. And the reason that's tough is because the longer this person goes without having oxygen to their brain, the more likely they're going to have a bad outcome and end up in a bad situation. So, you know, while we're doing those ACLS algorithms in the ER, the ER doc is also doing sort of some rough math in the back of their head, which is, if I call this thing too quick, I'm not giving this person a chance at life, perhaps, and I'm stuck with that lingering question. On the flip side, if I run this thing too long, if I run this thing into the ground and save his body but not his brain, I basically turn this person into the proverbial vegetable and nobody wants to live like that. In this case though, I really felt like we were doing the right thing by continuing forward, and we did, and we got him back into a perfusing rhythm, got his heart beating normally, got blood flow going back to his brain. And so I recognized this as a heart attack. I immediately called that rich cardiologist that my uncle wanted me to be. <laughs> and we got him to the cardiac catheterization lab where we found that he had a complete occlusion of his left anterior descending coronary artery, which is commonly known as the widow maker because that's what it does historically. But we got his lesion opened up. And amazingly, this guy walked out of the hospital a couple of weeks later. Now. As I said, it's easier than you think to resuscitate a body. It's much harder to bring somebody back with their brain. But the real hat trick in emergency medicine is when somebody actually remembers that you were the person who did it. So, so a couple weeks later, we get this thank you card handwritten by his kids where Dave says, I arrested in your ER on 7-7, home doing well. For me, the real icing on the cake for this particular case, and why I will always live in my memory, is I feel like I saved the right person, because he went on to write, I do not think words can express my thanks for saving my life. I now get more time to spend with my, oh, I choke up. <laughs> more time to spend with my amazing wife and kids. I really believe in karma and try to help people every day. Never did I think that karma will pay me back in full. Know that going forward, I will spend more time helping people around me. This I can do thanks to the team. I hope you will take some credit for the lives I will be able to help. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, Dave. Aww. And so, every year, on the anniversary of the day that Dave almost left this world, he comes back to the ER to visit us. He gave me permission to use this photograph. He brings his beautiful children around with him. And he brings a whole bunch of snacks like pizza and soda and junk food and all the other things that he is no longer allowed to eat. Thank you very much. I have a couple minutes for questions.